Pretty cool. And so, so thank you for what you do by giving to the church and praying. But let's 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 continue to pray because there are people um, dying, innocent people dying. I saw a school was bombed, a hospital was bombed. Um, so we need to be be in in continual prayer. All right. All right, we are in a series called The Gifts of Jesus, based out of Ephesians 4. Many, many times these gifts are kind of lumped in with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but these are not gifts of the Holy Spirit. Let me just state again, emphatically, we believe in all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We believe in the work and the person of the Holy Spirit, but the gifts in Ephesians 4 are the gifts of Jesus, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And I was praying about this, and I want to say something because you might say, well, Pastor Robert, I, you know, the reason I've never really studied about this is because, I, you know, I, I'm not one of these. Uh, these gifts really don't concern me. I, I'm not an apostle or an evangelist. You know, I'm not a Billy Graham. I'm not, I'm not a, a pastor. I'm not paid full time to teach, although I do some teaching in a small group or whatever. And so really these, and, and the Bible even says some, he just gave some these gifts. And so these gifts really don't concern me. Here's the problem with that. Um, he gave these gifts, it says, to mankind to humanity. In other words, it's, he didn't give the, these gifts to apostles. The, the gifts, apostles themselves are the gifts. And he gave them to us. So you need to know these gifts concern you because when Jesus ascended, he only gave five and he gave these for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. So he gave Jesus himself, we're gonna see those words, Jesus himself gave these gifts to you and me. So it's pretty important to figure out, you know, maybe read the owner's manual, like if you get a gift at Christmas and you try to put it together yourself and you got a whole box of parts left over, okay, it'd be pretty important to figure out why did Jesus give me an apostle? Why did he give me prophets? Why did he give me evangelists, pastors, teachers, okay? So this week we're on evangelists. That's the third one. If you missed one, we, last week was prophets, the week before apostles. If you missed one, please go back and listen. And here's the reason, not because I shared it, but because it's God's word and what you need right now might have been spoken in the one that you missed. There, there, could, there could be warfare against you. And when I say there could be, you understand that's a joke. You do have an enemy. You realize that, right? And so what you're going through could be the week that Satan said, don't go this week or don't tune in because you're too busy. And you, you miss that word from God. Uh, Pastor Josh did four weeks on Humanity, maybe you heard two of them or three of them. You need to go listen to the ones you didn't hear because there could be something there that you really need right now, all right? So Ephesians 4, verses 11 and 12, and he himself, speaking of Jesus, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. So here's our first point. What is an evangelist? I mean, this is a gift. What is an evangelist? We think of probably Billy Graham would be the first name we come to. And Billy Graham was one of the greatest evangelists ever. But what does an evangelist do? Where did the word Uh, from where did the word come, you know, things like that. So if you remember back in August, I did a series uh, called Good News. And we talked about um, uh, good news is what the word gospel comes from. 
Um, and that's what it means. Gospel means good news. And I actually went into the Greek. So I'm gonna go into the Greek a little bit, just again, just to show you how close the word gospel and evangelists are. Now in the English, you wouldn't think they're close, but they're right beside each other in the Greek dictionary. So the, the, the Greek word for gospel is euangelion. Now I'm putting it on the screen so all of you can write this down and memorize it this week because it may come up in conversation this week. <laughs> euangelion. But I want you to notice right in the middle is the word angel. Uh, many of you heard about the Greek word Angelos, we say angelos, but angelos, and it means a messenger. That's all an angel is, is a messenger. So here we have a word again that has this word, this, this angel right in the middle. So what euangelion means is a messenger with good news. Again, I did a whole series on this in August, and the first message I covered this. But you saw this euangelion let me show you the Greek word now for evangelist, euangelies. And look how close it is. This is where we get our word evangelist. There it is right there, evangelist. And again, right in the middle, you'll see the word angel. But what's the difference? The first word gospel means it's referring to the, the person who has the good news. An evangelist is a person who delivers the good news or who announces the good news. Uh, uh, the, the, a gospel is the person, it's referring to the messenger who carries the good news. But an evangelist is a person who delivers the good news. Now, please hear me, please hear me. All of you who've met Christ carry the good news. In other words, you now know the good news. The problem is getting you to announce it to someone. That was really good. <laughs> In other words, don't be like the postal worker who carries the letters with him or her all day and never delivers them. And a whole bunch of Christians are that way. You have a message from God that God sent his son to die for people that they don't have to work their way to heaven and you've carried it with you and you're not announcing it to anyone. Gosh, this is good. I, mean, I don't know. I, I, don't, I didn't take any uppers or anything before I got here, but, <laughs> but I'm just, <laughs> must just be the high of the Holy Spirit. I just... I just, I'm just telling you, so, so many Christians carry the good news and never deliver it, never announce it to anyone. Um, um, years ago, there was a young lady cutting my hair, and there's a lady that has cut my hair for over 30 years. And she couldn't do it and with her schedule. And so she had this young lady do it. And it was January 31st. The reason I remember that is because for some reason, at the first of the new year, I don't really make resolutions, but I asked the Lord for uh, goals for that year. And so one of the goals I set was to actually lead someone to Christ once a month. 12 people to the Lord that year. And so it was July 31st, and I was thinking, well, I'm probably not gonna make this goal, but if I, if I normally lead three to the Lord a year, I mean, personally, not through the pulpit, but just personally, maybe I'll lead six and that'll be better than three, you know? So I'll just, that's my goal, but it's, it's January 31st, and so I probably won't, you know, make this one. So anyway, I, uh, I went to get my hair cut, and it wasn't the lady that normally does it, and it was a young lady. And uh, about halfway through the haircut, she said, uh, you're a pastor, aren't you? And I said, yeah, yes, I am. And she said, well, you're gonna be really proud of me then for one of my New Year's resolutions. 
And I said, so what, what, what's your New Year's resolution? She said, I made a New Year's resolution to go to church every week, and I've been every week since January 1st. And I said, oh, I'm very, very proud of you. That's great. And then I did what I'm about to share with you because an evangelist equips people to be able to deliver the message. And so, um, and I, I function in multiple probably of these gifts as a, as a pastor of the church. And so I, I may explain that in one of the other, probably under pastor. Um, but the point is, I, I, I'm trying to equip you today to deliver the message. And so what I did was I just started with my story, which is what you always start with. It's what Paul started with as well. And so I just said to her, I said, that is so wonderful. I'm so proud of you. I said, do you know, I went to church many years before I actually got saved. And she said, you know, I've heard that expression, getting saved, but I don't understand it. And so I shared it with her. Well, by the end of the haircut, she accepted Christ. So she gave her life to the Lord. But all I did was deliver the message. Are you following me? So apostles equip us to be sent with the message. Prophets equip us to deliver a message of encouragement. And evangelists deliver us to to, to deliver the message of, of Christ and what he did on the cross. So, so it is a message. So number one is what is evangelist. Here's number two, what is my message? And um, I, I'm going to tell you what your specific message is. And the gospel itself, according to 1 Corinthians 15, is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But there's a pre- prelude to the, to the gospel, okay? And it is your message. So let me tell you what your message is, all right? It is simply your story. That, that's all it is. It's that simple. What, what is my message? It's your story. Now, here's what the devil tells everyone. So don't think you're alone in this. The devil tells everyone you don't have a good story. Uh, you know, um, the devil told Debbie that for years. I was saved at 19, delivered from drugs. She was saved at nine, delivered from bubble gum, you know? (laughs) Um, And she served the Lord ever since. Okay, can I tell you something? Being saved at nine and serving God ever since is a great story. It's a great story. There's nothing, that's that's a wonderful story. So you have a story. Now, there's a word in Christianity that gets us all mixed up and scares us when we hear this word. It's called, it's the word witnessing. But I want to take the fear out of it, all right? So uh, witnessing is not something you do. A witness is someone you are. Jesus said, you shall be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. By the way, we're talking about the gifts of Jesus and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. This is going to be really, really good. So, okay, this, this is, as the young folks say, tweetable. Um, <laughs> the gifts of Jesus equip us and the gifts of the Holy Spirit empower us. I told you it was good. You just have to think about it for a while. The gifts of Jesus equip us, but the gifts of the Holy Spirit empower us to do it, okay? So we're empowered to witness by the, by the Holy Spirit. But you are a witness. The question is, do you do it? Do you deliver the message? Do you tell anyone? So let me tell you what a witness is. A witness is someone who has personally seen and heard something. You say, well, a witness is someone who tells what he's seen and heard. No, because some witnesses take the fifth. Some Christians take the fifth. And I'm, 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 I'm asking you not to do that anymore. J- just tell your story. And, and a lot of times people say, well, 
I don't, I, I don't know how to work my story in. It is, it's the most simple thing in the world. You, they will ask you about your story. I promise. If you just do one thing, it's simple. Ask them their story first. And then just out of politeness, they will say, so what's your story? <laughs> See, just because they feel like, oh, I've been talking all and all about me. Tell me something about you. Well, since you asked. <laughs> it, it's simple. So, so a witness is someone who tells what he personally or she personally has seen and heard. But let me just show you this. This will blow you away. The shepherds were witnesses. Luke, uh, Luke 2.20, then the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen. The disciples of John the Baptist were witnesses. Then Jesus answered, said to them, go and tell John the things you have seen and heard. The disciples of Jesus were witnesses. In Acts chapter four, they told him, stop talking about Jesus. And in verse 20, they said, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Paul, the greatest apostle who ever lived. This is eight years before his death, 25 years after becoming a believer. Standing before a crowd at Jerusalem, Acts twenty two fifteen. 15, for you will be his, he's telling us about what Ananias said to him, for you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And then five years before he dies, he's before Felix, um, and he says, and Agrippa, and, he, and again, he shares his testimony. You're talking about a guy that was, that's been, that was caught up to the third heaven And he said in here, some of the things that I've seen, I can't tell you because they're too weighty for you. We can't even understand some of the things he did tell us. And there are some things that he couldn't tell us because they were too weighty for us. And yet when he's standing in front of unbelievers, he goes back to, see, I was riding this horse and this bright light show. He always went back to his story. And Agrippa says, you know, you, you're almost persuading me to become a Christian. But it wasn't doctrine that persuaded him. It was his story. Do you understand no one can argue with your story? Do, do you realize you, you, can, you, you might be able to argue with me on all sorts of points of theology. You can't argue with my story. I was thinking about this the other day. You, you go to the police department where I grew up, there's a record of my story, okay? <laughs> So you, you can't, actually there's not. I found out it was all juvenile and it went off at the age of 18. So I'm, <clears throat> I'm grateful for that. All right, so. But it's, it's your story. No one can argue with it, all right? Listen to this, 60 years, 60 years after the resurrection, John was the only living disciple left and the Gnostics were arguing, saying they had other revelation and that the revelation that the disciples had wasn't true. And that's the reason he wrote 1 John to the church at Ephesus. And here's what he said, 1 John 1 and 3. Watch for these words, seen and heard. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we've looked upon, our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. All you have to do is tell your story. If you were standing on a street corner and you saw a car wreck, and you were called to court to be a witness, you would not have to go to traffic school. (laughs) You wouldn't have to go to automotive school so you could talk about brakes. They just want to know, what did you see? And that's all they want to know. That's what a witness is. And by the way, if you share something that you personally did not see and you personally did not hear, it's called hearsay and it's inadmissible evidence. 
And there are a whole bunch of Christians talking about a bunch of stuff and the one thing that they cannot dismiss, inadmissible, that they cannot dismiss is your testimony because it happened to you. And and you're not trying to shove religion down their throat. You need to understand that. We, We have a natural gag reflex. When someone tries to shove something down our throat, we naturally gag. And yes, I said the word gag in church. In the Greek, it's gagos. It's no Greek word. You don't have to even talk about religion. It's just your story. That's all you're doing is you're just telling your story. So I have a friend of mine, he's a pastor, been a pastor many years now, um, involved in drugs in his teenage years, in his early 20s. And, um, and this guy had been witnessing to him that he'd gotten saved, but he was like all of us many times, well, I'm too bad, I can't, I can't change, I need to straighten up and come to God, all those things, all those lies Satan tells you. And finally, he decided to, to just end it all. And so he turned his oven on, and he put his head in the oven. And in, when he put his head in there, it's like it just the Holy Spirit just came, and he just started crying and saying, God, I, I can't change, I need you. I, I, and, I, and I do believe. I believe Jesus, Son of God. I believe, I believe. And he gets saved with his head in the oven, okay? <laughs> about three or four hours later, and he's only been saved. Then he gets out, by the way, of the oven, and he, he, think, he says to God, he's only been saved like one minute now, and he thinks, I need to read the Bible. And he says, God, where did I read? And he says, this voice came to him in, in just inside, not out loud, and said, read the book of John. And he had to look up in the table of contents, you know, what page the book of John was. And he read John, and then he was reading Acts, and he kept just, and he just said, that, that Jesus is real. He's real, you know. So this guy comes over a few hours later to do drugs with him. He says, I don't do drugs anymore. I don't even desire drugs. I got saved. I got saved. God changed me. I got saved. And this guy says, well, I want to get saved too. He says, come here, put your head in the oven. Here, put your head right here. That's the only way he knew how to get saved. And he had this guy, yeah, put your head in the oven. Now just just, just watch what happens, watch what happens. And the guy starts, oh God, I need to be saved. I need to be saved. And he got saved. It wasn't theology that saved him. It was the guy's story. You see what I'm saying? He'd tell me, he said, and Robert, that's not even the funny part of the story. And I said, I, what do you mean? What, that, what's the funny part? He said, I didn't even think about it until years later. It was an electric oven. <laughs> it may take some of you. You might have to ask someone. All right, here's number three. Stick to your story. You don't have to know where the dinosaurs went. You don't need to know how old the earth is. Don't argue about religion. Religion, listen to me carefully, okay? Okay. Religion is a systemized set of beliefs about God. Listen again, this is the definition. A systemized set of beliefs about God. That's why there are false religions. There are false systemized sets of beliefs about God. That's why the Bible tells us true and undefiled religion is to care for widows and orphans. In other words, true and undefiled, systemized sets of beliefs about God is to care for widows and orphans. You, you, you follow me? Okay, so there, it, it is systemized. Don't get into it. They have a whole system worked out of their belief. Do not argue about it. Stick with your story. Uh, one of the, so we're gonna, now I'm gonna show you just a few verses from the funniest chapter in the Bible. And it's a guy that gets healed who sticks with his story, okay? John chapter nine, verse one. 
Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, think about how sad that question is. They were trying to figure out how it fit into their systemized set of beliefs instead of saying, Lord, could you help this guy? Look at it. Lord, he's been blind from birth. We've watched you walk on water. We've watched you heal people. We've watched you raise the dead. Can you help this guy? They were more concerned about their systemized set of beliefs than a person. That's what religion does for you. And so Jesus basically says, it's neither this man nor his parents. That's not the point. But God's going to get glory out of this anyway. All right, then watch. Uh, verses, um, uh, let's see, okay, verse six. When he had said these things, he spat. All right, let's stop. Remember, Pastor Josh just preached four weeks on humanity and one week on the humanity of Jesus. I just wanted all of you to see that Jesus spat. You've probably never had this picture of Jesus in your mind. You probably never thought of Jesus going, (laughs) but he was a human and he spat on the ground. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva. So he rubbed his fingers in his spittle. And he anointed, that's a a, a biblical word for smeared. (laughs) The eyes of the blind man with the spittle, clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. I've always wondered why he said, I didn't need to wash before you spread mud on my face. (laughs) Which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Look how simple his story is. But watch all of the confusion and the arguing that starts. Watch the word said specifically. Verse eight, therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, is not this he who sat and begged? Some said, this is he. Others said, he is like him. He said, I'm him. (laughs) It's me, I'm him. Next verse, therefore they said to him, how were your eyes opened? Watch him stick to a story. He answered and said, a man called Jesus made clay. He left out the spatting. (laughs) And anointed my eyes and said to me, go to the pool of Siloam and washed. So I went and washed and I received my sight. Then they said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. <laughs> verse, next verse, verse 13. They brought him who formerly was blind to the religious people, the Pharisees, because it didn't fit in their beliefs. Now, it was the Sabbath that really didn't fit into their set of beliefs. When Jesus made the clay, spat, and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also asked him again how he received his sight. I love this. Watch this. He said to them, he put clay on my eyes and I washed and I see. He didn't change the story. He just getting tired of telling the same story. And he just made it a little more simple so maybe they could understand. 
Next verse. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such things, such signs? And there was a denomination among them. Now, I'm not saying anything critical about denominations, but you might not know this. Denomination comes from the word denomo. Let me ask the mathematicians here. What do you do when you have a common denominator? You divide. The word denomination means to divide. I'm not saying something critical about denominations, but look how divided the body of Christ is now. And there was a division among them. Another denomination started. They said to the blind man again, what do you say about him because he opened your eyes? He said, he's a prophet. That was the only way they knew to identify a man of God as a prophet, a woman of God as a prophetess. Next verse, verse 18. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received a sight. It didn't fit into their systemized set of beliefs until they called the parents of him who had received his sight. This is amazing. And they asked them saying, is this your son whom you say was blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered them and said, we know this is our son and that he was born blind, but by what means he now sees, we don't know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. Now, I love this. He's of age, ask him. He'll speak for himself. <laughs> they, they didn't want to ask him because they didn't like his answer. You know why they didn't like his answer? Because his answer was, I met Jesus and I'm different now. No one can argue with you about that fact. They can't argue with you. They can argue with you about the dinosaurs. They can argue with you about whether you have to be baptized or not or christened or all that, but they can't argue with you that you were goofed up and you're not as goofed up anymore. <laughs> they can't argue with you about that. <laughs> I love this. Verse 24. So they again <laughs> called the man who was blind and said to him, give God the glory. We know this man is a sinner. Now, remember I told you how the, the uh, uh, evangelists equip us, the gifts of Jesus equip and the Holy Spirit enables. Watch the enabling of the Holy Spirit here. This is called the word of wisdom because they can't answer it. We know this man's a sinner, verse 25. He answered and said, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I know, I was blind and now I see. That's what I know. In the Greek, this reads, put that in your pipe and smoke it. How does that fit into your systemized set of beliefs about God? I was blind, and now I see. And you can't argue with that. It goes on, though. Verse 26. Then they said to him again, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? <laughs> That's called the enablement of the Holy Spirit. And then it says, they said, well, you were born in sin. You trying to teach us? Here's what they basically said. Why, well, you didn't even go to seminary. And you think you're going to teach us? And it says they kicked him out. They cast him out of the synagogue. Now watch what happens if you get kicked out for getting healed by Jesus. Verse 35, Jesus heard that they had kicked him out. And when he found him, he said to him, 
do you believe in the Son of God? And just to paraphrase what happened next, he said to him, who is he, Lord, that I may believe? And Jesus said, he's talking to you right now. And he said, Lord, I believe. Stick to your story. The Holy Spirit will enable you. The gifts of Jesus will equip you. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, evangelists equip us how to share our story, but also how then to talk about some of those questions that might come up. Um, remember I told you how that we believe in all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Well, gifts, some of the gifts of the Holy Spirit are like a word of knowledge, that you know something about someone without having ever met the person before. Um, Debbie and I were sitting in a, a restaurant one time. This couple walked in, and he was just huge, a muscle, a bodybuilder, obviously, huge. And as soon as he walked in, I knew something, just like that. And she even said, you, you got a word, don't you? I said, yeah, I do. So we prayed. Lord, let him receive it. And I remember saying, Lord, give me a, a way to start the conversation, you know? Because you don't want to just walk over and say, thus saith the Lord, you know, or something. <laughs> so, so I walked over and I said, hey, I'm, I, I don't want to um, bother y'all or, you know, disturb you or something. I said, I just, I, just, I just have a question for you. And he said, okay. I said, have you ever worked out? And of course, he laughed and he said, so you know what I do now? Because I talk to a lot of sometimes the guys that, are, that really have these huge, you know, bodies. And, I, uh, and I'll just, because I just like to start conversations and see where they go. But I, I, I'll say to him now, I've got a great opening line. I say, you know, if you followed my workout routine, you could have a body like this. <laughs> so anyway, I said to him, I said, um, well, and they laughed, kind of broke the ice. I said, I don't want to bother you. I said, but when you walked in, I know this sounds strange, but I feel like the Lord spoke something to me that I'm supposed to share with you. And they looked at each other like a Mack truck had hit them. They just were like, I can't believe this. And he reached over and took his wife's hand. And I said, do you mind if I share it with you? He said, would you please sit down and share it? with us because we're talking about some things about this right now. And so I sat down and I said to him, I saw a vision when you walked in today. I said, I saw a vision of a little boy who was sitting in his grandmother's lap. And he put his head down like that when I said that. And I said, and his grandmother had a Bible in her lap. And she told the boy about Samson. And she said, if you'll give your life to God, he'll make you as strong as Samson. Do you know what I found out later? He was a former Mr. Universe. I said, she told you if you'll give your life to God, he'd make you as strong as Samson. And you gave your life to God right there sitting in your grandmother's lap. He looked back up at me and I said, but the Lord told me to tell you that he's kept up his end of the deal, but you haven't kept up your end of the deal. Now you better know you hear God when you tell Mr. Universe that. <laughs> <laughs> but he put his two fingers and his thumb like that, he started weeping at the table. His wife started crying. And he said to me, I was raised by my mom. She was a single mom. So my grandmother kept me a lot growing up. And he said, one day I was walking home and these boys threw rocks at me and one hit me in the head and started bleeding. He said, when I got home, my grandmother took care of me and he said she got her Bible and she read the story of Samson to me. She told me if I'd live for God, he'd make me as strong as Samson. And I made a commitment that day to do it. 
And he said, I told my wife that story for the first time on the way to the restaurant today. And I led both of them back to the Lord right there at that table. You know why we need these gifts from Jesus? Because they equip us for the work of the ministry, and then the Holy Spirit enables us. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I want you to just ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Just ask him. You're never too young to be a witness. You're never too young to deliver the message. You're never too old to deliver the message. You carry the message. You have a message. I'm just asking you to deliver it when you feel prompted to deliver it. So just let the Holy Spirit speak to you right now. Lord, we want to tell you thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Jesus, that when you ascended, You gave these gifts to us to equip us to be able to carry and deliver your message. And then you gave us the Holy Spirit to enable and to empower us. And I pray, Lord, we make a commitment, all of us, every campus and online right now, we make a commitment to be your vessels with your message in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen, friends. Can you stand with me? At this time, I want to invite our prayer team up to the front, and we're going to close this service like we close every service here at Gateway. You know, I love this message that Pastor Robert spoke. It's not about if we have a story or not. We all have a story. The question is, are we sharing it? And so maybe there are people here in this room who want prayer for boldness, or courage for, or, or courage as they, as they share their story. You want boldness to share your story, or courage to share your story. Well, our team is here and we would love to pray with you. I know that God encouraged us through this message. And so if you want to respond, our, our team is here. We'd love to pray with you. You can come now at the sound of my voice or, or maybe just something happened throughout this week and, and you want prayer. Uh, well, like I said, our team is here. We'd love to stand with you in that. We'll be here for as long as it takes to make sure every prayer uh, need is met. So uh, so you can go ahead, and go, go ahead and come on down now. I got two things before you before you go. One, just a reminder about Heart for the Kingdom. Uh, there's a, uh, for more information, there's a pamphlet right in front of your seat back, or you can go online to find out ways what more, find out ways on how you can partner with us and exactly what Heart for the Kingdom is uh, on that. And the second announcement I have for you is ladies in the room, uh, Pink Impact is coming up. And I'm telling you this, you are not going to want to miss it. You heard Pastor Robert talk about how uh, you can watch online as well, but there's something powerful about being here in the room. I've never been, but I can only imagine that it looks really pretty in here and it probably smells really nice. Uh, And so I just want to invite you out to that uh, and, you know, bring some friends. You may say, well, I don't really want to go. I don't really want to go alone. Well, bring a coworker, bring a neighbor, bring your daughter, bring a friend so that you can come, you can join, enjoy this conference with somebody else. I can tell you this, invite matters. And so you can even start praying now about if there's somebody in your life that God wants you to invite uh, to be a part of this conference. And you may say, well, Matthew, no one's really invited me. Well, hello, I'm inviting you. I would love for you to come and be a part of this conference. I've heard lots of great things about this conference. What I haven't heard is ladies who have left this conference thinking, man, I really wish I would have spent my two days elsewhere. So I promise you, you're not going to want to regret it. God does some really powerful things uh, in the lives of our women during this conference. We'd love for you to be a part of it. Can I pray for you before you go? Good. I'm going to do it anyways. God, I thank you so much for every single person in this room. God, I thank you for the message that you gave Pastor Robert and how it encouraged us, God, and how it will challenge us, God. God, I pray our tomorrow morning looks different because of what you've done in our lives today. Give us the boldness and the courage to share our story, God, to share the good news, to share of your love. God, I thank you for what you're doing in our life, God, what you want to continue to do in our life. Thank you, God. You are a good God, and it's in your resurrected name I pray. Amen. Amen. Gateway Church, we love you so much. We'll see you next week.